Experts suggest that in 40 years, we will run out of oil, which will affect our energy supply and ultimately our lives. There's a lot of tech that is being developed to address this problem, but is all this science and tech healing or harming the environment? It's a big question to ask, but thankfully we have some wonderful guests with us today. Starting with Catherine Loke, founding president of the Circle for Human Sustainability, Marvin Montefrio, Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at Yale and US College, and Elin Goh, co-founder of SG Veg Farms. So it's a big question, is science and tech healing or harming the environment? Well, Harish, uh, we tend to look at science and technology as if it's some kind of magic wand, but it's not. Technology is actually just humans being resourceful and, and using whatever we have to do what we do. So actually, science and technology neither heals nor harms. It's a tool and it depends on what we do with it. At this point, I would say we are actually ignoring a lot of the science mm. and we are still doing a lot of feel-good things. Mm. Uh, so uh, I would say in general, we are actually harming the environment. I've come to realize after kind of going through um, histories of science and technology that you know, for every innovation that our society comes up with, you know, it always comes with a set of setbacks. Technology is always like that. I mean, there's always the promise, but we always have to prepare for what's, you know, there's always impacts. Mm. And like for uh, Eileen, uh, your farm employs quite a lot of tech, right? Um, so what is your take on the question? Um, I'm actually more inclined to support advantages that science and technology can bring us. Um, I'm a neuroscientist and now a farmer as well. So like for example, as a neuroscientist, we actually um, depend a lot on science and technology to advance what we know about the field and to find treatments. And as a farmer, we are also using science and technology to manage plant growth and to actually help contribute to the environment as well let's say our farming, right? So we can always go for something that is quick and easy and then we can don't really care about environment. But I think for us, we're more into uh, sustainability. What can we use first rather than going into oh, using electricity? You're talking about converting a piece of land for um, farming purposes. So you usually involve like um, disrupting ecosystem or destroying natural habitat or chopping down trees and stuff like that. Mm. So we know that in Singapore, there are so many HDB multi-story car parks and most of the rooftops are underused. So that's a very good um, site for farming and we don't really need to like chop down trees and stuff. But what were some of the considerations when you wanted to set it up to be energy sustainable? Um, the first thing is we want to find a system that can use natural sunlight. We're also looking for uh, the different types of uh, breeds and species that are more appropriate for the local environment. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned about using the sun because the idea of using LED lights for planting to me in Singapore is ridiculous because we have sunshine all year round. But I don't agree with your point about uh, you know, growing on land being something that's not good because it's again dependent on how you do it. So uh, in the Circle for Human Sustainability, we actually support permaculture, which is a way of um, designing the land so that it actually creates a natural ecosystem. So actually there are many, many benefits to growing on land if you know how to do it. Uh, yeah. But unfortunately, there are very, very few farms like you. Most of the farms are like, um, you know, doing all this high productivity pesticides and all this yes. stuff, and then they are just cleaning out the whole ecosystem. Yes. So it actually just requires a change of perspective or change of mindset. If you treat agriculture as an industrial process, then it's toxic and then we keep it away from residential areas. It's necessarily so because you're using fertilizers and pesticides. Yeah. But if agriculture is a part of a natural process, how is it that the place where we're growing food for us to eat is poisonous to us? In a place like Singapore where land is scarce, uh, and there's always a, a, a commercial reason to develop some land into non-agriculture. So Marvin, how is that balance made between, uh, you know, um, doing something for economic reasons versus doing something for sustainability reasons? <laughs> Again, it's such a diffi difficult balance to make, right? Mm. We like to think that there are win-win solutions, yeah. but in most cases, you have to make sacrifices. Convenience is one, it's not going to be as convenient anymore to get certain types of food that you're so used to consuming. Having particular types of food that's available right at, the, at your doorstep 24-7. So there are, there are trade-offs that yeah. we have to, as, as a society, have to reconcile with. But do you see it as a sacrifice though? The reason we can have bananas all year round or oranges all year round or whatever is because of the global supply chain and the shipping. Yeah. So that's again energy intensive. 
Uh, and I don't, I don't see it as sacrifice, really. And you talk about convenience, I've got stuff growing on my balcony too, and it couldn't be more convenient than that. So to me, it's not really about uh, inconvenience or sacrifice, but seeing value a different way. I, I do agree that um, certain things might seem to be sacrifices, but they, they might not, right? Certain people, you know, unfortunately, um, would see, see giving up certain things as sacrifices. Now, I do research on indigenous populations, right? And, and I, I do admire, you know, their focus and, and their dedication to keeping their, their um, traditional practices intact. But at the same time, um, they themselves say that, um, you know, I hope that we're not stuck in this. They might want particular comforts that, that they haven't experienced yet. What about just creating more like awareness and uh, manage expectations? For example, durians. Some people these days consider, oh, you know, I should have durians all year round. Mm. Why? Can we actually leave that to their seasonal stuff and then just eat whatever that they, they come along? But I guess the difference is it's tough to feel the impact when it's not right now. But what about tech that is meant to be more green? Is that something that you guys feel that uh, it's, it's given too much glory or too much emphasis or it's overrated? If you're incorporating green technologies like electric cars, even photovoltaic cells, you need to burn fossil fuels to make photovoltaic cells. And how many uh, photovoltaic cells do you need to power Singapore? That's the solar like, panels, right? Solar yes. panels, solar right, panels, yeah. yeah. And much of the photovoltaic cells are constructed in China. They're burning a lot of coal, yes. right, yes. to make photovoltaic cells. Yeah. And as you transform energy from one form to another, you lose efficiency along the yes. way. So the question is, is solar panel really a green tech? What does it take to actually build a solar panel? And how much does it actually help us in terms of building that? And then how much space is required? Mm. And then how much maintenance and then replacing a part? Whether or not they are green tech is really a little bit kind of yes. like controversial. Yeah. Yes. But what yeah. sort of other types of tech, aside from solar panels, mm. like do you employ in your farms? With all the science and technology that we have, we actually look into the space that each plant will need. Mm. What kind of plants that we need? For example, we have a couple of different examples here. These are short and a little bit fatter. These are the medium kind of uh, sizes. Yeah. yeah. And then these are the long ones and thin. So with these different kind of uh, vegetables, right, then we actually can look into the different spacing. Mm. So then we can maximize the use of the space. As you mentioned, in Singapore, land is scarce. I always mention that it's um, a balance between you know, tech and then how we can make use of the technology for commercialization. So uh, we try to actually grow vegetables that are very delicious, but they are not really suitable for transportation. So for example, if you want to transport these to, I don't know, US or China and all those things, I think it's very difficult. There'll be a lot of knocks and all this stuff. Mm. Yeah. So it means that uh, it'll be more advantageous for us to bring the farm to the community. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that means we have very short food miles. Eileen, I'm glad to hear that you're able to grow local vegetables, you know, with, with soilless production because I've always been um, skeptical, skeptical of it. So we use technology to solve many different problems and in this case we're actually helping because we actually cover the whole rooftop with greens. I think that again is a question of how you define the problem. Growing on land rather than on rooftop means that you can actually um, keep on uh, making the soil more and more fertile and healthier and healthier. So uh, in that way, uh, it's sustainable in that it requires little human input. Provided we have enough land. Uh, but we do have enough land. <laughs> Singapore don't have enough land. Uh, but we have uh, many of those car parks. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we have uh, a lot of land that we're not using. Uh, so when we use permaculture, we can actually use land in between and around buildings, everywhere. It's quite nice to have these pockets of uh, places that you can use it for you know, good purposes, like growing food and stuff like But I think it'll be quite difficult to do um, in terms of maintenance and try to run it. But if you're doing it as a com community garden, then it's a different thing. It's a more holistic thing where the yield won't be so high because we're not growing at such density. So I guess it's about using tech in the most appropriate way to solve this problem of food. So uh, I have a little surprise uh, that would give a bit of a bit of a peek into how this has been happening over the ages. All right, so if you'll just come with me. They actually commissioned an artist to interpret and visually 
demonstrate how humans have been growing food, practicing agriculture over the ages. I see the rice terraces there, right? You can see that a lot of the labour is provided by humans. Whereas now we use machines. I mean, we kind of got like an overview of how food production has evolved over the ages. But we've been focusing a lot on plants. You know, like um, food production in general, especially farming of livestock and animals, there's a huge impact on the environment. Should we allow tech in? Because do you guys think tech can in some way solve or reverse the impact of food production on the environment? I think usually the negative impacts of uh, fruit production on environment comes from a couple of different main um, areas. Most importantly is logistics. Mm. Because we're talking about globalization and distribution, it's always about how we can reach our consumers. Mm. So imagine you can just come downstairs and then pick up your packets mm. of vegetables and it's just 100 meters away. Yeah. So we have this luxury to do that. So no other countries in the world can have this kind of landscape that Singapore has because we have 2,000 over car parks HDB multi-storey car parks in the whole of Singapore and they are all scattered um, all over the island and so that's very convenient for us. But one thing, you know, growing up in Singapore, we always hear that we have scarce resources, mm. right? So is it the best use of energy and time to focus on tech to solve farming? If we apply the energy lens to everything, then it becomes clear. And I mean, like, do you guys believe that it can kind of coexist? I believe in pluralism. Um, mm. in a sense that it's, it's always risky to put everything in one basket. Yeah. Right? The most recent one is COVID-19 pandemic, when we realized that our supply chain is actually quite vulnerable, in spite of all the efforts to mm. ensure that we have a robust supply chain. Mm. Yeah, and remember our goal, our goal of um, achieving 30% of our yeah. food source mm. um, by 2030, and that's like six years, seven years, mm. and it's actually pretty short, yep. and yeah. which is why People are really looking into technology to do it fast. Fast and then more. It takes uh, 10 to 15 times more energy to produce the food that we eat in Singapore, right? Because we import, right? So for every calorie that you eat, it took 10 to 15 times more energy to produce that. So we are energy blind right now. We've taken it all for granted. So we need to bring that back. So for Elin's, from her perspective, she you know, has her car park, multi-storey car park roof uh, farm near where the consumer is. Mm. So we already eliminate all that, <coughs> you know, the entire supply chain. Not just tell people to bring their own shopping bags and don't use plastic bag in the supermarket. I mean, seems like um, there is a lot of things to consider uh, with regards to farming, you know, the energy output, the energy input, the impact on the soil. But what about this recent rise of lab-based meat, uh, plant-based meat? How much energy do you need? So if you want to produce lab-grown meat, then you have a totally sterile environment. So you will need, everyone working in there has to be wearing PPE. It's a bio biological system, right? So uh, the moment you contaminate a tiny bit of it, the entire batch is gone. You know, so how resilient is this system? Is the question we need to ask ourselves. We just have to approach them with caution. Sure, let the technologies see through it. Let's just not put all our eggs in that basket. It's like Marvin said about solutionism. Tech always being the answer. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. A dangerous. It's like the first instinct. It will be very expensive. I think for the moment, yeah, it's expensive. Maybe one day they can be cheap. And um, you know, you're talking about simplifying the solution. Simplifying can be lab-based meat as well. So maybe growing an animal is actually very complicated, whereas growing cells are very straightforward because all you need to, to have is just a dish. But the environment needed for the cell-based meat is even more difficult to achieve. Um, not really, it depends. I mean, it depends on how you can simplify the whole process because I think in the beginning it's always expensive. And then after that, if you know how to simplify the process, mm -hmm. Then I think things can get cheaper. But I guess probably the first hydroponics farm was also very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, if you don't really have that kind of setting, you have no experience with that, it's very expensive. So once you have that going, right, it can be cheaper and cheaper because you already know how to do it. Uh, thank you all so much for the healthy debate, but we have come to the end of the conversation. I guess one thing we can all agree on is that the usage of science and technology on the environment must always be calculated both in terms of the benefits as well as the risks it brings. If you want to find out more, you can read Future on Fire, Capitalism and the Politics of Climate Change by David Camfield, and The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. You can find these books at your nearest library or the NLB mobile app. And if you want to find out even more about what we have discussed and other exciting issues, you can check out the Read to Be Sure website. So to end off, a question to you. 
Do you believe science and technology heals or harms the environment? Please let us know what you think by leaving a comment below.